Fabulous. All right. So <laughs> good morning, Eva. Last week, we talked about buyers, um, the writing offers and getting them accepted. Oh, no, I'm happy to do it, Eva. Happy to do it. Um, it'll be good because there's people that watch the recordings anyways. Um, so last week we talked about, uh, writing offers and getting those offers accepted. And today we're going to pick up from that point and talk about now we've got an accepted offer. Now what? So buyers contract close. Let's see if I can get my slides to participate. So we are talking about this portion of the pending path, which is, um, accepted con contract our inspections, um, any repair requests that we have, um, any lender requirements, right? Getting those uh, files underwritten, any title issues that come up. And then we're going to talk about how to close that transaction, what that timeline looks like in order to get keys to our buyers so that they can move in. So the first step, which is 9A, is opening escrow. So once we have an accepted offer, generally speaking, we, um, the buyers usually dictate who the title company is. And so we usually know who they are. Sometimes we go with the seller's company to get our offer accepted because they've got pre-escrow open for one reason or another. And sometimes that's just the little nudge that we need in order to get our offer accepted in a multiple offer situation or to help escrow run smoother. But in any case, what we wanna do is we wanna make sure that we get copies of the residential purchase agreement any addendums, any amendments, and any counter offers need to go to everyone involved. So title and escrow, um, the other agent or broker, your client, and the lender, okay? Now, in addition to that, you usually should have a transaction coordinator. I always recommend, especially that the agents in our office, um, TC one of their files or at least work closely with their transaction coordinator on a file so that you understand how our compliance system or how SkySlope works in case something ever happened with our transaction coordinator that you wouldn't be dead in the water and that you would know how to manage that file. That being said, transaction coordinator and your client gets copies of everything that is signed that is part of the transaction. Okay, so title and escrow, the lender, those just get the purchase agreement, counter offers, AEAs, and, and, um, and addendums. Okay, the other agent is going to get copies of basically anything your buyer signs, especially if there's a buyer signature and a seller signature line on it. And then your transaction coordinator um, is with your client there. They're going to get copies of everything. Okay, any questions about that? No. Fabulous. <laughs> All right. Um, in addition to that, the next thing that we do is the earnest money deposit needs to get to the title company. Um, and I always advise the buyers to verify wiring instructions prior to sending that earnest money deposit. I encourage them to, you know, they sign that wire fraud advisory and I encourage them to um, make sure they call the title company and verify the wire information before they actually send it. And then title company is also going to send us a preliminary title report that we want to review, okay? On that preliminary title report, we wanna make sure that the property address matches what's on the contract. We wanna make sure that the seller's names match what's on the contract, that they actually have the right to sell that property. And we wanna check, um, there's usually numbered items and we wanna make sure that there's not anything on there that would cause a delay or a cancellation of escrow because it was unexpected. Like if we look at that list and there's a first lien in the amount of, you know, 600,000 and our offer was 700,000, we're probably good. But if they have another tax lien for like 200,000, that could cause a problem. So we just want to double check that. You're also going to see on there, it'll go over whether the taxes have been paid. Um, it'll talk about any um, CCNRs that are recorded against the property, which would be our covenants, conditions, and restrictions. Most properties that are inside the city limits have CCNRs. Some outside the city limits also do, and some inside the city limits sometimes do not, but most of them for the most part do. There's usually a hyperlink on that preliminary title report for the CCNRs, and it's usually in those, those numbered items because those are all the things recorded against the property. In addition to that, we also want to look on that preliminary title report for any um, 
easements recorded against that property. Most properties have an easement for utilities, which allow the utility provider to access the property to read meters or service lines. But you might also see, especially once you start getting outside the city or in some of those that have like shared driveway spaces, there might be easements across that land for access to their property. They might have somebody else that can drive across their property in order to access it. So we just wanna look and see what easements and encumbrances are recorded against the property. As part of opening escrow, I send my buyer intro email out. And the buyer intro email looks like this. Um, it is gonna introduce to my buyers what the next steps are so that they know what to expect. It says, congrats, over the next few days, this process is gonna feel a little crazy. It's okay to feel a little overwhelmed with all the decisions you have to make and the information that you'll be receiving. Please know that I am here for you. If you have any questions, concerns, or just need help, let me know, right? I'm setting the expectation for my buyers that they're gonna feel overwhelmed. That's, that's normal, right? We just wanna set that expectation. Um, so I'm doing that ahead of time so that when they start feeling that way, they're not all of a sudden like, oh my gosh, this is not normal. I've got to cancel, right? So we're setting that up. Um, then I'm going to let them know, you should receive an email from my transaction coordinator. And then I'm going to put my transaction coordinator's name there. She will be helping behind the scenes to make sure that we get everything we need during this transaction. She will also be setting up a website through Homelight Listing Management where we will upload all of the property disclosures, reports, inspections, and any other important information for you to review. Any documents I need you to sign will come to you for electronic signatures from blank, right? So if you're using AuthentiSign, you may wanna put it in there. If your TC uses DocuSign, you may wanna list both of them there. So just so they know what to expect, they get something random from another program, not to just assume it came from you and sign it. Okay, if you get anything to sign through a different program, please ask before opening, right? Again, just setting my buyers up for success. The next steps, the deposit. It's due by, and then I put in the date that it's due by at the latest to title. And then I put in the title company's name at blank. And that's where I put in their address. The total due is, right? So I put in the amount of the good faith deposit. You can make that deposit via personal check, cashier's check. You can do a wire or you can do a wire transfer. Let me know if you want wire instructions. Please make sure the money comes from an account that your lender has record of as they will need to verify that the funds came from your account. Again, I'm setting that expectation that the lender is going to verify that deposit has cleared their account and to not pull it out from underneath their mattress. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. <laughs> A lot. <laughs> <laughs> so we're just setting that up for success. Loan docs. Enter the loan officer's name. We'll be in touch with you to make sure that you get the initial disclosures taken care of and then get the appraisal ordered. Right? I'm just laying out for them what to expect. Insurance. Contact your insurance agent to get a quote for homeowner's insurance. Your lender will require this information. So once you have it, please forward it on to them. If you are unsure who to contact for this information, your auto insurance carrier is a good place to start as you will sometimes get a multiple policy discount. If you need some recommendations, let me know, right? So we're starting that insurance process day one. Inspections, if desired, need to be scheduled. Our inspection contingency is blank days. I would fill that in. We need to have all inspections completed before, and I usually put in the date before the contingency removal there, so that we make sure to have all of our inspections wrapped up with enough time to review them. There are several options for inspections, all are optional. If it was a VA loan, I would uh, edit that to be, there are several options for inspections, all are optional except the pest inspection that is required by the VA for your loan. Inspections that we recommend. Pest. This is going to look for anything that can damage the wood of the home from water to pests, $110 to $150. Whole home. The inspector looks at the whole home, top to bottom. They go in the attic and crawl space if available. They check the roof. They will test all major systems and components, $400 to $550. Chimney. Clean and inspect the chimney and fireplace, $125 to $150. Again, if there's no chimney, we just take that one off and renumber. Roof, 
They inspect the exterior of the roof to make sure that it's sealed and watertight, $125 to $150. HVAC, they test the HVAC system, air conditioner and heater, $150 to $200. Sewer lateral inspection. I probably need to put an explanation there and a price, but I think I added it during one of our classes, so I don't think I've updated it. Um, pool inspection. They will run the pool equipment, make sure it's functioning properly. They can also answer questions for you on how the pool functions and best practices, $200 to $300. Right? So those are our basic inspections. The ones that may not be on here would be chimney if there is no chimney. Um, and then HVAC if there's no HVAC system. Most houses have HVAC. And then pool, of course, if there's no pool, we would take that one off. If there's something else that you see that needs to be inspected, add it on there. Like if it's up against a big hillside, mm -hmm. you may want to throw on there that you're recommending mm -hmm. that maybe they have somebody out to do a stability of the hillside test, a, uh, a environmental engineer, right? We've had those done before. Um, or if there's other concerns that you saw when you walk through the house, you should make those recommendations. However, to catch that at the bottom, at the end, I put, um, there are lots of others too. Let me know which ones you want scheduled. And if you have any other concerns that wouldn't be covered by the above inspections. You do not have to be at the inspections, although we do recommend it. The inspectors will be able to go over everything with you, answer any questions and address any concerns. Please let me know if you plan to be there. Figure on it taking two to two and a half hours. And please let me know your schedule from today through the end of next week so that I can schedule the inspections. You are welcome to select the inspectors yourself or I have inspectors that I can recommend, right? So here I'm giving them options like, hey, if there's inspections that you're worried about that aren't mentioned here, just let me know. If you wanna pick your inspectors, let me know. If you want recommendations, I can do that as well. All inspections will need to be paid at time of inspection or before. They will all take payment with cash or check at the inspection, or you can pay with card over the phone. Let me know if you need phone numbers. And then I wrap up with congrats. You are well on your way to being a homeowner. Thanks again for allowing me to represent you in this process. I look forward to getting you the keys to your new home. So that's the email that I send out um, as part of my intro process once we get in the contract to our buyers. Any questions? No, but how can I get my hands on it, Amy, on that email? I'll send you a copy of that. Um, once you log your attendance today, when she pops it up there, she'll make sure to get you a copy of that, as well as the transaction action plan that we have. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. 9B is going to be property investigation, right? We're going to look at the seller disclosures. So the seller should send over the seller property questionnaire, the transfer disclosure statement, the listing agent should do an agent visual inspection disclosure, and we should also get copies of any HOA documents, if there is an HOA, as well as copies of any leased and leaned items. We are going to do our agent visual inspection disclosure, our AVID inspection, for anything um, material deficiencies regarding the property. We should get a natural hazard zone disclosure report. Just so you know, on the seller disclosures, I usually look those over. I usually upload those to Home Light Listing Management and I make my buyer aware that we've added those documents on there. I also usually will send them a message if there's something they should really pay attention to. I will send them a message to be like, hey, just a heads up. If you check out those inspections, it looks like there was a prior insurance claim or I don't know if you care, but there was a death on the property, right? So I might draw their attention to something that, um, they might find important. Otherwise, I just ask them to make sure they review them. The natural hazard zone disclosure, I'm just going to glance at that and make sure it's not in any like high fire hazard severity zones that I wasn't aware of or flood zones that I wasn't aware of or anything like that that might pop up on there. Otherwise, I just ask them to review that inspection and then I let them know if there is something um, that comes up as positive on one of those disclosures. We're gonna do our inspections. We're gonna review those reports. And then any other investigation of the property. This is where I let the buyers know that they should like spend time driving through the neighborhood, checking it out different times of the day, different days of the week to make sure they know the neighborhood that they're getting ready to move into. Step 9C is the lender process. 
the lender, remember we got them a copy of the fully executed contract, the residential purchase agreement, along with any counter offers, addendums, and amendments to that contract. They're going to send out the initial disclosures to be acknowledged by our buyers. And then they're going to make sure they collect any updated documents from our buyers and submit that file into underwriting. At the same time, they're also gonna order that appraisal. One important thing that we need to make sure happens is before that appraisal, we need to make sure that the house has um, smoke detectors, carbon monoxide detectors, and that water heater is double strapped. That's something that's gonna be call called out by the appraiser and will require a reinspection if it's not done prior to that time. So usually when I go do my AVID, those are the things that I look for during that visual inspection is I always make notes that to make sure that water heater is double strapped and that I've seen the smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors. Once the, the file has been through underwriting, the lender is going to kick back conditions. Oftentimes your buyer is going to ask you questions about these conditions because they assume you know more than they do. Um, and those are just things that are required to complete the underwriting process to get the file through um, to the point that we're ready to sign. So it might be things like letters of explanation for large deposits in their account, updated bank statements. It may be a letter of explanation for any of the aliases that are listed on their credit report. They may need a verification of employment or a verification of income. So there's so many things that might pop up from that. Um, I usually check in with my lender on a regular basis to make sure I kind of know where we're at and how many conditions are left and if we think we're going to have any problems meeting those conditions. So never hesitate to check in with that lender. Any questions? No. All right. Step 9D, we haven't even made it to 10 yet. 9D is we're going to wrap <laughs> up escrow. Um, this is where our inspections have been completed. Our buyers may say, oh my gosh, like I love this house, but right, there was those things that popped up on the inspections. As part of my buyer consultation, I prepare them in advance that we don't ask for repairs for minor things like missing switch plates, a light bulb that's not functioning, like that we think it's just a bulb. Like we're not gonna ask for those things to be repaired, but major things we absolutely are. The HVAC system's not working appropriately. The um, dishwasher is leaking all over the floor when it was run, right? Things like that. We're gonna ask for those on repairs. And generally speaking, if I'm gonna ask for repairs, let's say the HVAC system isn't functioning properly. We've got a quote from the HVAC guy. Um, I'm gonna ask for that HVAC system. I'm gonna throw some other things in there, some bonus items. So I have some items to negotiate out, or we just get bonus items taken care of if they agree to everything. There's um, lots of different options when it comes to repairs. We've talked about this when I've covered the request for repair. The buyer could um, ask for either the repairs to be completed prior to the close of escrow. They could ask for a reduction in the purchase price, or they could ask for a credit um, towards their closing costs or a combination of those three. So just keep in mind, there are some options there. Um, the buyer is gonna get those final conditions over to the lender. If it's necessary, we may need an extension of time for contingencies or we may need an extension of time for the close of escrow if something happened to cause a delay. Um, it's time to remove those contingencies. So once our contingencies come due, it's time to throw in that contingency removal. And just so you know, what generally happens there is I will usually let my buyers know that it's time to remove contingencies. I will ask them if they're comfortable removing those investigation or inspection contingencies. Um, once the appraisal comes in, I'll ask them if they're comfortable removing that appraisal contingency. And then I'll always check with the lender to make sure that they're comfortable with us removing that loan contingency. Okay, once I've checked with the lender, then I will let the buyers know that I've checked with their lender and that they are comfortable and make sure that they're comfortable. So I'm always checking with the buyer before I send them that contingency removal. I'm going to send them over those contingency removals as they're due to sign. And then I'm going to stick them in a folder and hold on to them until that listing agent badgers me for those contingency removals. The reason <laughs> being is I want my buyers to believe that we've removed contingencies, but I also want to protect them in case something comes up last minute that would cause them to want to cancel. So I want to leave that option available. 
So until that listing agent basically sends me a notice to perform or starting to get kind of irritated with me for not removing contingencies, I generally will hold on to those contingency removals and not submit them to a listing agent. Um, it's just best practices when taking care of your buyer. The sellers can't cancel on you. They have to serve you a notice to perform, at which point we would just submit to them those contingency removals. During this time of wrapping up escrow, it's so important to communicate, communicate, communicate. During the first week to two weeks, we are in constant contact with our buyers and all the parties, making sure everything's on track, doing inspections. We're still seeing them on a regular basis. And then if your escrow is like 30 days, those last two weeks of the escrow period, everything's kind of done. We're just waiting for either like the close of escrow to come, like the date to come, or we're waiting for just a few things to be wrapped up. So we're not in as constant contact as we were initially. So it's important to make sure that we're still communicating with our buyers. We're still checking in with the lender. We're still letting the listing agent know what's going on. Um, and that every time we talk with our buyer, we let them know when to expect to hear from us next, assuming everything's plugging along as planned. Okay, so communication is key. Um, apparently, we skipped step 10. I think this was 9D was really 10, but we'll go on to step 11. <laughs> Finalize the transaction. Oh, I skipped a step on this one. Um, at the same time we remove contingencies, this is a good time for the buyers to give notice to their landlord if they're renters. We usually don't give notice at the beginning of the transaction, number one, because if we give 30-day notice and we have a 30-day escrow, there's no overlap there. And then they start to get stressed about the moving date, especially if something gets delayed. Um, also, we haven't had inspections. We haven't reviewed disclosures. We've still got contingencies floating around out there. And I'd hate for them to give notice to their landlord, decide not to buy this house, and then end up being homeless. So oftentimes, um, I instruct my buyers to not give notice until we've removed all the contingencies. They're going to have some overlap, which is going to work in their favor for the most part. Because, you know, this is usually about 14 days in, they've got two weeks left in the transaction, we give a 30 day notice to our landlord, that gives us two weeks after the close of escrow to complete the move in process, or if there's a delay at the end, we're not super stressed about that. Um, and the problem, the thing is, is when we um, close escrow on the property, we pay the interest on our mortgage through the close of escrow as part of our closing costs. Our next mortgage payment, it's going to start accruing interest the next month. So we aren't going to have a mortgage payment for like a month and a half. So if we were to close today on a property, which is like mid-May, our first payment isn't going to be until July 1st. We're going to pay our May's interest from the close of escrow till the end of the month today at the close of escrow. And then as part of our closing costs, and then our interest will start accruing June 1st through June 30th for our July 1st payment. So if we overlap with our landlord by giving notice, we're not going to have rent due for two weeks at the beginning of June and a mortgage payment. They'll just have prorated rent due at the beginning of June and then their mortgage payment due in July. So it works really well and it reduces the stress. Okay. Um, any questions before we move on to the next step? No, no questions. Amy. All right. Uh, the next step is going to be to finalize the transaction. What's going to happen is the lender is going to inform you that the loan is clear to close and they're going to issue the closing disclosure or the CD. The CD needs to be issued about five days prior to the close of escrow at the latest. Otherwise, we need to ask for an extension because what happens is when that closing disclosure gets issued and the buyer's... Um, acknowledge that they've received it, there is a three-day wait before we can sign the final loan docs, which puts us about five days prior to the close of escrow. So just kind of keep that in mind. I'm always checking in with my lender on those last couple of weeks to see when that CD has been issued to make sure we're on target to get docs to escrow and sign and close on time. Once that CD has been issued, then that's where I usually schedule the signing with the escrow company. I usually check in with my buyers and say, hey, we're getting close to the end. The CD has been issued. Your loan's clear to close. We're good on everything with the house. What's your schedule over the next three to five days to be able to sign those final documents? And do you prefer to do that at the title company during business hours? 
Do you prefer to have somebody come to your house or where would you like to sign and what times are you available? Right, I'm collecting that information. I'm not scheduling the appointment. I'm just getting that information from them so that my next step is I'm gonna turn around and go to the escrow company and say, hey, here's my buyer's contact information. They would like to sign with you at the title company in your office and they're available anytime from three to five on Thursday and Friday. And then I let them know that they can schedule directly, reach out to the buyers to schedule directly with the buyers and let me know once they've scheduled that appointment, as well as to send me over an estimated settlement statement. So I can review and make sure any credits are on there um, mm -hmm. and anything that everything looks right when it comes to that closing statement. So then I'm going to review that closing statement. This is a good time too, after that CD is issued for the buyers to schedule the utilities to be turned on. Right, because now we know that whether we're closing on time or not, or what that plan close escrow time is going to look like. Um, so I let them know. Usually, I give them a list of the utility holders in the area, and let them know that they can start scheduling those utilities to be turned on as of the date of the close of escrow, and let them know that um, you know if there's things that they need to be there for that I would wait and do it the day after the close of escrow. So like your TV or your internet just in case there is a delay and we don't have keys at 10 a.m. in the morning, because usually those utility companies give you a window that they schedule those for the day after the close of escrow. Um, we're also gonna remind our buyers that they need to wire the closing funds. Their funds to close should have been listed on that estimated settlement statement or on the CD, that closing disclosure. And I usually recommend that they round up. If that number was $28,452.27, I say, hey, just um, you know, send $28,600, like a little bit over. You'll get refunded the extra at the close of escrow, but that just ensures that if there's any changes that they're covered so that we don't have any delays. And then we're also going to do the final verification of property condition. The final verification of property condition, we use our VP form to do that. And um, we're just verifying that the property is in the same condition as on the date of the accepted offer and that any repairs were completed as negotiated. If things aren't done or the property is not in the same condition, keep in mind this is not a contingency of the sale of the property. So technically you can't delay close of escrow, but this would just give the buyers the ability then to go after the sellers if the verification or if the property is not in the same condition or repairs weren't completed. It also gives you time to try to make sure that that has been taken care of or reach out to the listing agent to let them know that it wasn't done as negotiated. Any questions about those final five days? Still no questions. Fabulous. All right, step 12 is the close of escrow. Once those final documents are signed and the buyers wire any funds necessary to close escrow, then the lender is going to review those documents that were signed. They're going to do one last credit check. This is why it's so important to instruct our buyers not to make any purchases on their credit, open up new credit accounts, buy those appliances on you know, no interest for six months, not to do any of that until the close of escrow has happened, until they have keys in hand. The lender is also usually going to do one last final verification of employment. So they should be aware of that. Once the lender is satisfied, the, the lender will wire loan funds to escrow. And then once the escrow receives those funds, they are going to release that file for recording. That means that they're, they're going to send over copies of that deed of trust or the original deed and whatever else needs to be recorded with the county over to the county's office to go on record. And then once we get confirmation that we are on record, that means that we are officially closed. Generally speaking, on a residential purchase agreement, um, it stipulates that we're going to get keys, your buyer's going to get keys at on the day or at time of close of escrow. So as soon as we are confirmed on record, usually your buyer can get keys. So usually on that morning of the close of escrow or the day before, I'm checking in with the listing agent to ask um, where I can pick up any extra keys or garage door remotes and to make sure the lockbox is still on the property so that I can pull the key out of the lockbox. 
Um, and then I'll, I usually let them know that once we're on record, I'll grab that and then I'll shoot them over a text to let them know that I pulled keys from the lockbox so that they can remove the lockbox from the property. Um, once you're closed, make sure you send out thank you cards to everybody that was involved in that transaction, the listing agent, the title company, the inspectors, right? We're looking to build rapport and build relationships. We want to send thank you cards to the lender. So we want to just make sure we tie that up with those thank you cards. Um, any questions on that close of escrow? Usually this process takes about two days, just so you know, once they sign the final documents, usually the next day funds are received by title. And then the day after that, we, re we record. Sometimes if they're really on top of everything, we can do it all on the same day. They can sign, lender sends funds, we record all on the same day, but usually it's a two to three day process. Any questions? Nope. Fabulous. All right, step 13 is buyer takes possession of the home. Again, um, you just wanna make sure that you ask in advance about those keys, garage door openers, gate remotes, um, because your buyer's depending on you to make sure they can get into that property on time and in a timely manner. I usually check with my buyer the day before closing as well to ask them what their schedule is so that I can make sure to set time in my schedule to meet with them when they're available to get them keys take those sold home photographs in front of the property so that we can use those for marketing on social media and that we can pass those off to our buyers as well so that they have those keepsakes. Um, and then I usually don't do like a closing gift at time of closing, they're getting keys. I usually delay and do that later. So step 14 is all about creating clients for life. You wanna make sure to create that post-close system and process. Okay, we want to make sure to update their address in your CRM, your contact relationship manager, because now they have a new address, assuming that they're moving into a primary residence. I usually will send them the home warranty information like a few days after closing, maybe a week after closing. So they have that information. Closing gift usually happens about a month after the close of escrow. It gives me another opportunity to touch base with them, ask for referrals, make sure everything's going well. I usually check in with them usually about weekly for that first month after the close of escrow to make sure they're happy, make sure that they're, everything's working well in the house, they're not having any issues. Remember to ask for those referrals, ask for reviews, and then usually like every January, um, make sure you send them a copy of their closing statement because they're going to need it for their taxes. So that's kind of what my post-close system looks like so that they have all those details and are ready to go. And then after that, we add them to our 36 plus interaction plan and we will turn them into future clients once again. Um, any questions on contract to close? No questions, but um, thank you for that last tip on, because I do gifts right at the closing and then I don't actually follow up because I think, oh, they're so fed up with me during that month. So I do not follow up for at least a month. So I'll just adopt the system. And sometimes I just want or worry that if something is broken, I'll call them and it happened before. And then they bring it, you know, instead of happy times, they're like, this is broken. That is broken. Well, so. it's a good time for you to remind them that they got a home warranty if they got one. Right. And, and yes. remind them that and they can always reach out to the home warranty if they have any problems with the claim to reach back out to you or it's a good opportunity for you to show them that oh well yeah absolutely like I remember the home inspector noted that and I do have you know referrals for contractors or referrals for handymen would you like those so that you can get that taken care of right so it's a good time and sometimes things just get missed and then it's just making sure we manage that but just being able to get them those vendor recommendations would be helpful for new homeowners as well so we always want to be the person. Don't be afraid of problems. Um, just make sure you, you already have the solutions ready to go. Okay. All right. Absolutely. Well, I guess I was the only one. So Jennifer joined us too. She's just being quiet. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm here. I'm sorry. No, you're fine. <laughs> you're fine. <laughs> Perfect. Any other questions before we wrap up today? No, just thank you. I appreciate it. 
Absolutely. Thank you for joining us. Make sure you log your attendance. Oh, the other thing. So um, Jennifer, before you hopped on, we were going over the buyer intro email. So if you log your attendance today, Abby will make sure that you get a copy of this buyer intro email that I send out to all my buyers once we enter into contract. And okay. I also have a transaction action plan. So if you'd like a copy of this as well, um, she can send you a copy of this. And this just kind of goes through step by step through what a perfect transaction would look like kind of in order. Awesome. Yeah, no, that would be great. Um, I don't believe I did log my attendance. Um, I'm not too sure where I do that. <laughs> yep. So if you open up your chat box, there should be a link in the okay. chat box um, to log your attendance. Beautiful. I will do that right now. Perfect. Thank awesome. You all. Thanks so much. Tomorrow at 11, we have Old Republic. They'll be in the office and on Zoom talking about um, loan assignments. And then tomorrow evening, we'll be covering social media lead generation. Okay, great. That I love. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you all soon. Sounds good. I'll talk Thank to you, you later. Bye. Bye-bye.